you guys for joining us. Um, we will now be starting the lecture. Hi everyone, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be here with us today. I'm just going to help facilitate on behalf of the AI team. My name is Kaylee. Um, if the other members of AI want to stand up and just say their names. Hi, my name is Maya. I'm also part of the AI. Hello. Austin. Hi, everyone. My name is Mahi. Um, welcome and thank you for coming. And I am Amy Shapu. I'm Mali Muhari. Thank you for coming. Um, so I just want to give a brief overview of what Africa Initiative is. The Africa Initiative of Syracuse University is a campus-wide project housed in the Department of African American Studies within the College of Arts and Sciences. Its purpose is to focus on Africa as an important site of knowledge by highlighting teaching, research, and publication work by Syracuse University scholars in the arts, humanities, social and natural sciences, mathematics, engineering, and others. AI is backed by a dedicated team of undergraduate and graduate students with the faculty as board of directors. The African Initiative presence in the Department of African American Studies reinforces the critical site where most academic work on Africa at Syracuse University is done, and where the continent and the Caribbean are perceived as a concomitant parts of the department's Pan Africanist vision. In bringing together scholars from various disciplines, the Africa Initiative not only promotes interdisciplinary exchange, but also reinforces the efforts to diversify and internationalize the educational experience of our students. By providing an alternative vision and platform for constructive discourse on Africa and African peoples, the Africa Initiative is helping alter the dominant perception of Africa as a continent living with perpetual crisis and despair. I hope you guys are all here for our event today, which is on militarism and the socio-political changes in West Africa. Today we are here to discuss and gain knowledge on the political and social changes that have been happening in the West Africa region. We are lucky today to have three distinguished speakers. They'll talk for about 15 to 20 minutes, and then we're going to open up for Q&A at the end. Um, so our first speaker is Amber Murray. Um, she's an associate professor of political geography at the University of Oxford School of Geography and Environment. She's an alumna of Syracuse University's Pan African Studies program. Amber is a deep colonial political geographer working in interdisciplinary fields of political ecology, the geopolitics of knowledge in the South, and resistance studies. Her award winning research on the Chad Cameroon oil pipeline combines the attention to the dynamics of racism, resistance, the environment, and imperial, commercial, imperial and commercial penetration. She has previously held academic appointments at Jimma University in Ethiopia, the American University in Cairo, and Clark University in the US. She was the 2015 dissertation fellow in African and African and African and African diaspora studies at Boston College. Amber is the editor of A Certain Amount of Madness, The Life, Politics, and Legacies of Thomas Sankara, and has published widely, including articles in the Annals of American Association of Geographers, Political Geography, Singapore Journal of Tropical Geography, and more. Our second speaker is going to be Marcel Kitisu. I hope I didn't pronounce that wrong. Um, Great. Um, he is a regional scholar affiliate with Cornell Institute for African Development. He serves as adjunct professor in Africana Studies Department at the University of Albany and contributing faculty in the PhD program of the School of Public Policy and Administration at Walden University. He is editor in chief of the International Journal of African Studies and editor of the Journal of African Foreign Affairs. He is coordinator of the International Consortium for Geopolitical Studies of the Sahel. Dr. Kitisu previously taught in the cohort PhD program in public policy and social change at Union Institute and University, served as faculty director of the Global Humanitarian Action Program at George Mason University, executive director of Africa Faith and Justice Network. He earned a PhD in political science from Syracuse University and a doctorate in contemporary history in France. Um, his research and publications focus on international security, the politics of hunger, water, and political stability, and China's presence in Africa. And our final speaker will be Kasim Kone. Um, he is an, anthrop he's an anthropo anthropologist and linguist. His areas of interest are African cultures and languages, African history, religion, folklore, development anthropology, medical anthropology, and African politics. 
He was the former president of NANSA. His publications include the 2020 text, International Health and Culture, Bamana Khan Gafe. And in, did I say that right? No. Yeah. 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 Oh, good one. And in 2006, The Muslim Experience in America. So thank you. And I'll turn it over to. Um, hello. Good afternoon, um, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, it's a great pleasure to join you uh, virtually today. Um, and of course, to return to the Africa Initiative, um, which is such an important hub for critical intellectual thought um, uh, about um, the continent. <clears throat> I'm very grateful to Mahi, um, for the kind invitation and um, the facilitation. Um, and of course, to Professor Campbell, who has um, been my um, teacher and educator um, for many years and um, to whom I will be so grateful um, always um, for opening um, my eyes about so many different political realities. Um, I, so I was asked actually to join this panel um, to speak about militarism in West Africa from perhaps a bit of a different context um, than we might um, initially anticipate. And that is um, in the context of the 1983 August Revolution um, in Upper Volta, uh, what is now Burkina Faso. Um, and so looking in particular at the life and the legacy of the Pan-African uh, Marxist revolutionary Thomas Sankara, um, who was himself um, a, a, a military captain. Um, and so part of the value then of considering the historical trajectory of Thomas Sankara is perhaps that it offers us not only another way of thinking about social and political organization um, in West Africa and Burkina Faso, um, but also thinking about um, more radical potentials for the military um, and uh, military officers and, and for the experiences of, of military training. So I'm really interested to hear from the other panelists um, and to situate this uh, kind of historical um, reflection in that context. So um, to first start with some context for this conversation, conversation which pertains to some of the biographical details of um, Thomas Sankara. Um, Thomas Sankara's um, turn to the military was actually um, somewhat inadvertent. Sankara, uh, as a child, had initially presented himself um, uh, with an interest in studying and pursuing medicine. He wanted to be a surgeon, um, but for junior high school, he was overlooked in favor of children um, with influential military or, or family connections, um, even though many of them had performed poorer than Sankara in the classroom. Um, and so he wasn't able to realize that initial ambition of pursuing medicine. This was an early lesson um, for Sankara on the significance of um, patrimonial um, relations, family connections, and wealth, rather than intellect uh, or merit. And during this, this then period of frustration that Sankara felt, he heard a radio announcement for a scholarship for a military high school, PMK, which was at a military base near Ouagadougou. This uh, PMK was founded by the French army in 1951, and the school was recruiting students. Um, and paying scholarships to students who performed well who were accepted. And so Sankara is accepted to PMK. He had already had um, childhood interests in physical activities um, and a kind of rigorous intellectual um, uh, 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 abilities. And he was very interested in reading from a young age. Um, and this kind of, um, 
uh, kind of rigorous intellectual curiosity was supported uh, through his uh, subsequent military schooling and training. And this had a considerable impact on the trajectory of his life. Um, but what's also perhaps interesting for us to think about in the context of, you know, thinking of radical potentials of the military in West Africa um, is that had Sankara's family been able to pay the fees for a superior school, Sankara likely never would have pursued a military education. Um, he wouldn't have traveled to Madagascar and um, elsewhere where, he, you know, he received his military training um, and his, his politics um, would not have been influenced um, by militarism. Um, and so thinking about as a, as a child, how actually the military opened up um, options for Sankara's uh, education. So after attending PMK, Sankara was selected as one of the few handfuls of students to be sent to, to officer training um, in Madagascar. Um, this was in 1966. And um, with, for those of you who are familiar with Sankara's biography, um, many biographers have attributed this experience in Madagascar um, as being kind of a, a, a foundational moment in his exposure to um, political realities across the continent. So while he was in Madagascar, he studied military strategy, um, but he also studied things like sustainable agriculture and agroecology, which was an emerging field at the time. Um, he concentrated on writing and editing um, and, and, and playing the guitar. So after he obtained his diploma as a superior officer, Sankara remained in Madagascar for another year. And during that year, he kind of enriched his studies um, even further. Um, he studied the economy. He also pursued physical labor um, and um, it pursued a kind of um, radical self-sufficiency. So this um, involved um, often intense sporting activities um, and also things like he planted um, a field of rice and um, his his attention to food and agroecology and agriculture would persist throughout his political career. Um, and when he later returned to Burkina Faso um, and was a captain um, at the military command base in Po, he encouraged uh, military personnel to engage in farming activities with community members. Um, and he also um, stipulated that military personnel would eat um, once a month um, with, with local communities so that there was um, a different kind of relationship between the military and um, civilians um, for, for Sankara. He read widely the works of René Dumont, um, who was foundational in the field of agroecology, Amilcar Cabral, um, Kwame Nkrumah, and all of these um, uh, intellectual uh, traditions we can see through um, Sankara's subsequent um, politics. So um, we can see then that um, for Sankara himself, the military um, is quite important. But if we look at Burkina Faso or um, you know, at the time the Upper Volta, um, the uh, Burkina Bay military scholar, um, Adrego reminds us that the army has dominated the exercise of power in Burkina Faso almost un uninterruptedly since independence. And that includes the 27 years of power under Blaise Comparoé, who um, himself was a military um, uh, captain um, prior to becoming president after the assassination of, of Sankara. So if we look at um, the popular movement of um, October 2014, which removed Comparoe from power, Audrego highlights 
some of the ambivalence of the roles played by the army in the country. He remarks that the army is at once a force capable of being, quote, blindingly coercive and, quote, liberating. Audrego explains that the perpetuation of the power of the army, particularly at the level of the head of the state, is not the product of direct domination, but rather, quote, the result of a process of normalizing the charisma of the army in Burkina. So tracing the history of the charisma of the army, Audrego argues that prior to Kamparoe, um, the army often intervened on behalf of the people against civilian elites, and that military commanders did not function, quote, function in an authoritarian way, nor did they demonstrate ethnic or regional favoritism. So from this reading of the military, then, we can see that the Sankara years um, likely boosted the army's association, uh, association with charisma. And this was a sentiment that was later instrumentalized by Comparoe's presidency. During um, Sankar's presidency, he urged people to collaborate on revolutionary projects of self-determination. And this was often in the face of enorm enormous international and domestic capitalist and neo-imperialist pressures. Sankara believed active participation was central to the emancipation of people for themselves, and then it had to be through their own labor. As a former military captain, Sankara recognized the mental and the physical potentials of cultivating a determination and a work ethic. Um, of course, this commitment that Sankara had to sacrifice and to hard work was not uniformly well received. Through the platform of collective work, the country embarked upon a series of what were called commando campaigns or rapid nationalist interventions. But these were to resolve concrete and immediate challenges faced by um, Burkina Bay. At a rally in Ouagadougou in 1983, Sankara explained, quote, we want you to come out in massive numbers to build. You are going to build in order to prove that you are capable of transforming your existence and transforming the concrete conditions in which you live. You don't need us to go looking for foreign financial backers. You only need us to give the, the people, their freedom and their rights, end quote. But there was this, uh, this neo-imperial uh, Cold War context that also required a certain amount of rigidity by the revolution, um, by the revolutionary party in order um, to, to, to be successful. Sankara said, quote, imperialism is everywhere through the culture that it spreads, through its misinformation, it gets us to think like it does. It gets us to submit to it and go along with all its maneuvers. <clears throat> Indeed, Sankara's assassination fits within a larger landscape of assassinations of anti-imperial and anti-capitalist African leaders. So Sankara's um, assassination was the norm within the geopolitical context of imperialism in the South in the Cold War. Um, as you can see from this only partial um, and incomplete timeline of assassinations and suspicious premature deaths of anti-colonial, anti-capitalist, nationalist leaders and intellectuals from Africa. This is from 1955 to 1995. As Bruno Jaffrey argues, quote, the contextualization of Sankara's assassination within the political and economic events of the time underlines the narrow path that Burkina Faso was allowed to follow. Um, and I, I just emphasize this here again um, so that we can understand that Sankara's leadership was constrained um, in particular ways um, 
by an anti-communist West, which disapproved of the Burkina Faso uh, revolution. In his speeches, for example, Sankara often addressed what he called infiltrators um, or counter-revolutionaries who were watching and observing the revolution. He explained, quote, you have to avoid becoming one of the rats in the UN corridors because you can very quickly fall into international complicity, a kind of acquiescence that reduces the problems the people face to sterile, sparring matches between theoreticians, end quote. So indeed, <clears throat> Sankara, um, you know, had needed to respond then to the multiple pressures um, that were restricting um, the agency, not only of his leadership, but of um, the revolution and the revolution's ambitions. Um, and one of those steps was to restrict multi-party politics. Um, now he did this on the basis that they had been historically superficial um, in neo-colonial contexts in African societies. So Sankara was opposed to multi-partyism, not because he wanted to pursue a career as a tyrant or that he believed um, in absolute power, but because he saw it as a major obstacle to the emergence of a genuine democracy. So he explained this view um, at length in a 1983 interview for Afrique Asie, describing the multi-party system as a, quote, quantitative illusion. He argued that the greater and greater numbers of registered political parties had no bearing on concrete practice um, in, in Upper Volta. Um, and, and so he took Upper Volta of 1978 to demonstrate this point, um, saying that at the time, the country had no fewer than nine contending political parties. He said, quote, for many, especially for those who through ease or ignorance wanted to perceive it like this, it was the very model of democracy a general in power who was questioning himself with eight adversaries freely organized. It's tempting to stick the label democratic to Voltaic politics. It was written, celebrated, and sung everywhere. For us, it was only a masquerade, nothing else, a masquerade that was very expensive, end quote. So we see that the multi-party system as it operated then for Sankara was a colonial deception. This is what he said, a quantitative illusion all the, way, all the while obfuscating that these nine parties as Sankara explained were made up of 27 persons all with the same interests intimately linked by the political and financial affairs of the bureaucratic and political bourgeoisie. This context and the origins of the revolution within a coup opened up the revolution then for streams of criticism. And we know Sankara came to power in a military coup. This invariably informed his presidency while also seeming to invalidate it, of course, for many of his critics. One of whom um, it was the Burkina Bay political philosopher, Joseph Kizirbo, um, who argued that, quote, a better coup d'etat is still nonetheless a coup d'etat. What was needed was a system of governance that did not perpetuate a cycle of military coups, end quote. Indeed, the revolution was dismissed early on in the international and Western media as just another coup. Sankara responded at a press conference um, on the 21st of August 1983 by articulating a distinction between types of coups, saying, quote, it is not a question of the military taking power one day and giving it up the next. It's about the military living with the Voltaic people, suffering with them and fighting by their sides at all times, end quote. 
In regards to the role of the military in society, Sankara spoke harshly about the need for political and ideological training, saying, quote, a military man without a political education is a potential criminal. While Sankara was openly critical of militarism, speaking often in disdain for global proliferation of arms and scientific research in support of warfare, he did not speak sufficiently enough of the implications of his own coming to power through a military operation. Even though he had tried to avoid the coup d'etat and he himself had not actively participated in the events of the coup itself. Um, in the biography of Thomas Sankara written by Ernest Hirsch, he explains that Sankara's reluctance to engage in a coup d'etat um, was only overcome after he had learned of plans for his own assassination and that this had prompted progressive rebels um, to act first. In the end, um, Sankara didn't have time to build upon the revolution's initial successes. He didn't have time to rectify its disappointments or to make the gradual improvements necessary in his revolutionary pedagogy. He was assassinated on the 15th of October, 1987. The late Egyptian political economist Samir Amin recognized that Burkina Faso's August Revolution was, quote, an unfinished revolution. In this, Sankara's revolutionary pedagogy is a starting rather than an ending point. The elucidation of a pan-African political economy of happiness, of pedagogical self-empowerment, and rigorous anti-imperial tactics perhaps provide foundations for reimagining the state and reimagining the military and its relationship with people um, on the African continent. Thank you very much for your time. I look forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to have Q and A's after all the speakers have gone. Um, so we're going to move on to Marcel Kitisu. try to get him on. So can you see my slide? Yes. Can you see my slide? Yes. Okay. So, uh, thank you, everyone, for coming this afternoon to this uh, uh, session. I promise the discussions will be interesting. And I particularly want to thank uh, my former student, uh, Elil Arslan, who is uh, calling from the Cook University of uh, in Turkey. And also my son is here, Kuti. So everyone else, thank you for being here. So on the screen, what you will see is uh, West Africa, uh, West, Western Sahel. I will use those terms interchangeably. And uh, this is the region I'm going to talk about. So we recently witness a wave of coup d'etats in West Africa, 2021, 2022. We have a successful coup d'etats in Burkina Faso, January 25th, 2022. Sudan, October 25th, 2021. Guinea, September 5th, 2021. 
Mali, August 18, 2020, and May 24, 2021, Chad, May 9, 2021. There are also third data, the Democratic Republic of Congo, a attended coup on February 8, 2022, Guinea-Bissau attempted coup on September 5, 2021, Niger attended coup on March 20, uh, on March 30, 2021. Cameroon is an interesting case. Paul Bia, the president of Cameroon, has been in power for 40 years. He is now 89 year, years old. And it is risky in the country to talk about those or Bia, Cameroon. Similar case in Côte d'Ivoire with the demise of Oufou Bagny in 1993 led to political instability and two civil wars, the first in 2002 and the second in 2011-2012. Kagame, the president of Rwanda, in a recent interview with the magazine Jeune Afrique, February 2022, said that whenever there is a coup d'etat, people blame the military. He added that people should also look at the behavior and performance of civilians in power that the military used to justify their intervention. Then the military must, that is my own comment, then the military must solve the problems they claim civilians have failed to address. And those problems are enormous. They are endemic, demographic, climate change, economic, and also due to the interference of foreign players. The risk created by military coups as a result of these challenges are local and regional. One, there's a risk to governance processes and to government legitimacy. A coup d'etat easily leads to another coup d'etat as it creates conditions and structures for another coup d'etat. Second risk, the risk of uh, political mimetism or uh, imitative behavior. Neighboring countries can be infected by the virus of a military takeover which can lead to regional political instability. Number three, risk to effectiveness and legitimacy of uh, regional institutions. In this case, the G5 uh, Sahel Joint Force, ECOWAS, and the African Union. Why do people dance on streets? when there is a coup d'etat in Africa. Some of the root causes of stability or uh, instability are first demography. I will give one example. Serge Michelov in his book, Afghanistan Development of Jihad published in 2018 pointed out the case of Niger, a landlocked Sahelian country. At the, end, at the time of independence in 1960, Niger had a population of 3 million people. Now the population is about 20 million. By 2035, it will have more than 40 million. 
the forecast for a period between 2035 and 2050 varies between 75, 76 million at a fertility rate of 5.1 and 89 million at the fertility rate of 7.2. It remains to be seen where food and employment will come from to meet the demand of a rapidly growing population. And uh, Niger is just one example in the region. Economic issues. According to a 2018 report of OECD, the title of the report is Illicit Financial Flows, the Economy of Illicit Trade in West Africa. I quote, informal enterprise account for anywhere between 40% and 75% of gross domestic product and employs anywhere between 50% and 80% of the available workforce in different West African countries. By one estimate, the informal sector currently accounts for around 60% of all urban employment and provides 90% of new employment created in the 1990s. Consequently, economic growth has translated into increasing inequalities and the highly visible gap between the haves and the have not. This in turn has caused young people to become disillusioned, disillusioned with their government and has entrenched intergenerational differences. Arguably, those schisms have exacerbated social fractures and they weaken the rule of law with implications for the recruitment of the youth into criminal industries. This report shows how little control government have over their economies, and at the same time, how ineffective sanction can be against Mali, for example. The other factor is climate change. The Sahel is one of the regions most affected by climate change. Therefore, natural resources are getting scarce, contributing to food insecurity and mass displacement. Competition for resources is also causing intercommunal violence, particularly between farmers and there. There are, these are some of the problems governments, civilian or military must solve. Hence, development and security must be simultaneous, not sequential, as the title of Michelin books imply, development or jihad. The coup d'etat is not a magic wand that can, per se, solve those problems, nor is the abstract idea of democracy. Political reforms, innovative governance, and moral imagination are uh, what is needed. The downfall of uh, Kabore in Burkina Faso was due mainly to the perceived failure to deal with security issues. While the other countries of the regions, in the other countries of the region, the issues are those of corruption electoral irregularities and governance issues. External players in geopolitics as well as in geostrategy. The Sahel 
occupy an important and a special place. Military forces positions positioned in Israel can easily reach Southern Africa, Northern Africa, the Middle East, the Indian Ocean, and the Atlantic. Therefore, the interests of global power players overlap there, including jihadist groups before global agenda, China, Russia, the United States, and France. For the jihadists, their presence is felt throughout the region, from Mauritania to Somalia, and in between countries at various degrees of instability. Great power rivalries. China is involved in security operations in the region, mainly through peacekeeping operations, which have the advantage of combining military presence and apparent neutrality. Russia is increasingly and directly involved through a private security entity known as the Wagner Group, most notably in Central African Republic and Mali. The zones of activities of those players overlap in Western Africa and Western Sahel. The two major players, however, are the United States and France. So this map shows the Sahel countries with uh, if you think of the Sahel as a gigantic dry river, the countries around the Sahel, I will call them riparian countries. So I took this map from the Africa Faith and Justice Network in parentheses. I was once the executive director of this organization. This map shows, shows you the activities of the Islamic State in the Greater Sahel. As you can notice, most of the activities are concentrated, concentrated at the border of Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger. This map shows you uh, the US anti-terrorist uh, coalition. So uh, the East Coast is not a for of interest here, but the West Coast, you can see that uh, those countries uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the US coalition overlap with uh, the France zone of influence activities of uh, the jihadists and, uh, and the activities of uh, the Russians and uh, the, the Chinese. And this map shows you uh, the French flag show, show you where the oper Operation Barkhane, uh, activities of the Operation Barkhane led by France are taking place. The blues uh, tell you about the uh, European Union presence working on capacity building. So the US military presence, so I will be very brief on the US military present, presence and concentrate more on France military activity. So the US military presence to the Africa Command operational since 2008 has a drone headquarters base in Sender, Northern Niger, and has a annual military exercises with African countries, including this year, last February. France, <coughs> continuity and change. The French strategy has been to maintain control over the African 
plateau de present or the present height. So in comparison to the present height now located in the Czech Republic, uh, that the present height was used by Napoleon to achieve a victory in the Battle of Austerlitz in 1805. So the importance of the Plateau de Prazen for the Battle of Austerlitz uh, can be compared to the importance of the Sahel in geopolitics. That is uh, what I'm trying to explain. So this space that represents France's precary or literary private reserve is a mixture of Western, Arabic, and the African civilizations, a combination of Christian, Muslim, and traditional African religions. That African plateau with geostrategic dimension can be used as a launching pad for operations in the Gulf of Guinea, across the Atlantic, the Horn of Africa, Middle East and North Africa, the Red Sea, and in the dire direction of Southern Africa. This was demonstrated in 1982, Falkland War, when the French allowed the British to use their military facilities in Dakar. Senegal to intervene in Southern South America. Another illustration can be found in the rationale, not the public statement, but the rationale of France's intervention in 1979 to remove Emperor Bokassa from power in Bangui. The official reason was presented as a humanitarian mission. However, Christine O'Krent, a French journalist, and the Comte Alexander de Marange, former director of the France, the French Counter Espionage Services, have a different inter explanation of the French intervention to remove Bokassa. I quote here, they, they wrote in French, so the trans English translation is my own translation. So the central African operation, Operation Barracuda, was an operation implemented by France to free this unfortunate country from its Emperor Bokassa and to prevent the Libyans from taking over a position at the center of Africa. The strategic thinking of Gaddafi was to occupy Chad then the Central African Empire situated just below. Thus, he, meaning Gaddafi, will be in a strategic area, the equivalent of the plateau with present on the basis of which Napoleon conceived of the maneuver of the Battle of uh, Austerlitz. Such victory will be exploited in the di direction of the Gulf of Guinea or the Horn of Africa and the Red Sea, hence helping communist Ethiopia and achieving control over a large part of Africa. Professor Kitsiu, I don't want to cut you off, but you have about two minutes left. Okay. So if I have two minutes left, I'll have book. Uh... Okay, so the other reason France's ambition is beyond Africa is that uh, France never decided whether it should be a continental, pa a continental power or a maritime power. If uh, France wanted to be a continental power, it has to compete with Germany. If uh, France wanted to be a maritime power, had to compete with the United Kingdom. So France found an alternative in its presence in Africa to assume 
to assume international uh, importance and avoid a uh, diplomatic obscurity. So I will uh, uh, say that uh, the French decision making in African politics has uh, changed dramatically. It more and more decisions are made in the French Ministry of Defense rather than in the French uh, Foreign Affairs. In addition, serving a diplomatic corps in Africa is not career builder, but serving in the French army in Africa is a career builder. So the military are more and more involved than the diplomats themselves. So to conclude, that uh, what we need to do first is to remember the warning the FDR gave to the goal and to church it during World War II. That we are in this fight on your side, but we are not in to help you keep your archaic and medieval idea of empires. So what needs to be done and what is urgent is not only to promote African agency in state building, because a threat is perceived from outside and security is implemented based on outside perspective. What need, we need urgently is to decolonize the mindset of uh, former colonial powers. So I will stop there and I will reserve uh, my, the other aspect I will have an address for Answer questions and answers. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to hear from the same comment. Uh, good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today. Uh, Mualimu Campbell and I have been talking about this for some time. And for some of you who don't, uh, when we actually explained how we first met the first time, I was in graduate school at Indiana University. And uh, the university had, I had asked the university to give me some money to bring some professors to talk at the uh, symposium. So it was, there was some major crisis in Africa then, and that's how I invited Professor Campbell as a graduate student. And that is about almost 30 years ago. I don't know if you remember, while you were on campus, that's when Chris Honey was assassinated. So I'm very glad to be here, uh, very happy to meet people from the African Initiative. My paper is long, could probably take 40 minutes, so I'll just read and speak as I go along. The title of my paper is The End of France as a Parasitic State in Africa, Lessons from Mali. The recent political and diplomatic tensions between Mali and France may be symptomatic of what to expect in the relations between Africa and the Western world in the future. More and more countries in the Sahel and beyond, Francophone and Anglophone rise to challenge French and Western interference in the Sahelian and African markets. Their military presence, their continued predatory political, financial, and economic schemes. Today, there is an uprising of the Malian people that if successful and replicate promises to bring the African continent to its true independence and sovereignty. This uprising is slowly turning into a pan-African movement of civil society organizations through social media. Worldwide marches and demonstrations on behalf of Mali by pan-African youth and other groups have contributed 
to expose the French and the Western predatory policy, policies on the continent. Of all former European colonizers, France is the most parasit parasitic. France was a major participant in the slave trade. As European slavery came to an end, France embarked on colonizing African Asian countries, another form of slavery, but ended uh, after about another century. Okay, French colonialism in Africa was based on the direct rule, a full blown involvement in the life of the colonized. To this end, French expected the colonized to speak the French language. The direct rule resulted in a linguistic and cultural domination that continues to this day through the carefully crafted umbrella of Francophonie. Another form of French continued domination of African countries after their independence are economic and financial through the CFA currency, a currency printed in France and pegged onto the euro to the benefit of the French treasury. France is an unabashed predator for Africa through its imposed military accords and its infamous colonial agreements that prevent any former colony to enter any agreement with any other country prior to France's approach. A secret agreement links France to its former colonies, sometimes known as the colonial tax or colonial debt, um, intended to reimburse France for her colonial endeavors. So we have to pay France for having come to colonize. So this still continues to this day. This agreement covers many areas of African nation sovereignty, including defense, the economy, national politics. On the defense side, France has exclusive, exclusive rights to supply military equipment to the former colonies, to train military officers, and to deploy French troops and to intervene militarily in any country to defend France's interests. This accord obliges the former colony to renounce any military alliance with any countries unless authorized by France, and to ally with France in the event of war or global crisis. On the economic side, this agreement gives France access to any raw or material or natural resources in the former colony. It also gives priority to French interests and companies in public procurements or public tender and public tenders. The former colonies are under the obligation of, to use the financial community of Africa, which is the CFA. And the obligation to send France an annual balance sheet and the report of the state of the reserve. To support this, the survival of French language and culture, the former colonies are under the obligation to make French the official language of their countries and their language of education. Okay, French economic and financial enslavement. The independence of African countries from France since 1960s has so far been just nominal. Africa's monetary dependence on France that was established uh, since the start of World War II in the colonies called the Franc Zone continues to this day. Initially coined CFA. So the acronym CFA then stand, stand for, uh, stood for uh, community, uh, Colony Francaise d'Afrique, CFA. Okay. Uh, this colonial currency evolved into CFA again, same acronym, but the African financial community in six African countries and eight West African countries after their independence. The CFA currency is backed by the French treasury. The worst type of financial slavery, the CFA was pegged onto the French franc before it was uh, pegged to the euro when France joined the euro uh, in, in, in 1999. CFA is not a currency cho uh, chosen by or created by Africans. Since its creation, the CFA has been regulated by four rules ratified in two treaties signed by 14 countries and France in 1959 and 1960. Okay. The first treaty is that France guarantees the unlimited convertibility of the CFA and the Comorian France into any foreign currency. Okay, treaty number two, the parity rate of the French currency, the French franc, then the euro is fixed. Number three, capital transfers within the monetary zone are fixed. 
which is not true. For example, Central Africa, you have a CFA. In West Africa, you have a CFA. If you want West African CFA currency, you cannot convert it in, in Central Africa or, or from Central Africa to Africa. If you go try to convert it, you know, France gets its cut out of this. France is responsible for establishing the value of the CFA since its creation in 1945. In the 1960s, 1970s, when French central bank, banks opened uh, in African states, all bank presidents were French nationals. The CFA franc being the currency of all um, French-speaking countries is a serious problem because it is structured intentionally to subject these countries to the domination of France. This monetary cooperation agreements reinforce this domination, reinforce this domination. The Central Bank of West African State is a subdivision of the French Ministry of Finance. Within it, there are French representatives who sit on the board of directors and who have a casting vote. French representatives control the economy of the CFA country in its most real form. The decisions taken by the, the Central Bank must be submitted to the French Ministry of Finance before they are approved. Since such practices do not appear in the text, but they are part of the schemes France has established since 1945 with the creation of uh, this currency. Uh, it is estimated that 80% of African revenues are captured by France with, its, uh, with, with this currency as they structurally belong to France. It means that Africans using the CFA work for France. When Africa creates wealth, only 20% of African GDP belongs to Africa. The rest of the monetary wealth that Africa creates is for France. It is France and the French employees who make the money at the Bank de France. It is France that creates the economic aggregates on which the currency is based, no, which are not in reality the economic aggregates of African, that Africans experience in their own countries, but European aggregates. Then you could understand that in CFA countries, people cannot borrow money because if you borrow, Money, you have still have the interest rate is usually never below 12 and a half percent. 10 percent more? Oh, 10, 10 minutes. Okay. So uh, I will skip uh, French multinationals and corrupt French politicians uh, and move to French military in Africa. Um, um, Monday, let's try it. Then I'll do it faster. Okay. Uh, since uh, I just leave the paper, stop. Okay. Since independence, eight African countries have signed defense agreements with France: Gabon and the Central African Republic, 1960; Ireland was 1961; Togo, 1963, after they killed the president of Togo; Senegal and Cameroon, 1975; Djibouti, 1979; and Comoros, 1981. Within this framework of these treaties in which France makes economic gains, it can help reestablish order internally, fight rebellions, fight against intervention of another state and lead African troops. France also signed secret defense treaties with Chad and Zaire. We don't know what are in these treaties. In the 1980s, France had the total control over the military communications and intelligence of the Ivory Coast. Though the defense agreements, through this defense agreement, France exercised control over the size and the military capabilities of most Francophone African countries. In addition to the, mention, the eight countries mentioned, France also has signed military agreements with 26 African states, including Anglophone ones. Okay. Um, there is a long list of coup d'etats, as you've seen with uh, 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 the professor from England. Uh, the list of coup d'etats that, uh, uh, that either France supported or gave tacit consent to, including that resulted in assassination of head of state, Sylvanis Olympio, Modibo Keita, Amani Jori, Marian Guabi, uh, Mokhtar Urdada, Thomas Sankara, and Burkina Faso, and uh, recently, Laurent Babo. 
the French military, just to be able to say a few things about the French military in Mali, because that's also is, was what I really wanted to talk about today. Uh, contrary to what is said, the France has never been invited to come to Mali. But that's the news that you hear everywhere. In January of uh, January 11, 2013, you know, there was a bunch of um, uh, uh, insurgents moving towards the south. But these insurgents were moving to, that were moving towards the south was something of France's making. Because these insurgents were led by Iyad Agali, who works for the Director General Security Exterior, which is French equivalent of CIA. And so when uh, these insurgents were moving towards south, the Mali president came ask French for air strikes, so air support and intelligence, that's all. He wrote a letter, the French looked at the letter, penned it differently, sent to him as the military were moving towards the south. And then what that happens, he was under so much pressure, he accepted to the terms without telling anybody in the government. The first, first, first French operation that came is called Operation Serval. Serval is a slim, uh, well, a, a legged uh, dog that lives in the Sahara. And what it does is peace here, skips here, peace here. That's what they call it, Operation Serval. Actually, French not very smart, but if you look at how they call their operations, you easily understand what is happening. So that's what they did because uh, when Ian Akali, their guy, decided to move south, he moved south with some other extremists, some other jihadists, and he communicated information to the French. So they would never bomb Ian Akali's people, except by accident. So that's why the Cervantes pee here, skipped here. So they, and then at some point, they, they just stopped doing it. So that's what Serval is called. And when you look at Serval, um, the number of countries that are involved in Serval just do not make sense. There are more than 10 European countries involved in Serval. The United States also was a major supporter of Serval because the US did take care of transportation and the refueling of French uh, um, uh, jet fighters in the sky in about two, less than two months, actually, the United States uh, uh, military they refused, made, they made about 100 sorties between Chad and Northern Mali just to refuel the fresh air, air, air aircraft. So that is Serva. The next uh, one was called Barkham. Bark, all of these, everything that I'm saying to you, is, is, these are animals that are living there. And Barkham means uh, a crescent shaped uh, dune, sand dune, you know, which is made by the wind blowing. When the wind blows, it just creates this. And so it's this, this dune, sand dune keeps, the shape keeps changing as the wind blows. Okay, I think I've got about one minute or two minutes left, right? Okay. No, no, no please. Think. No, the third one that we have right now. So Balkan also had more than um, 12 European countries, countries that you have never heard of. You know, countries like Lithuania, Greece, uh, uh, Latvia, oh, uh, why would such countries be in Mali? Okay, the third one is called Takuba. Uh, Takuba, which is what is there right now, that means sword in both Tamashe, which is language of Tuare, and swords also in Songa language. So what do you use, what, what, what do you use a sword for? To slice something. So that was meant to slice not just Mali, but the Sahara. So when Malians decided that they wanted to get rid of the French, it all started about in September when at the UN meeting, when the French UN ambassador meets the Mali ambassador to the UN and shows him what kind of policy they want to introduce for war without consulting Malians. It's in the corridors of the UN that he enforced the Mali. He calls the Mali presidents. They said, no, no more. There have been more than almost 30,000 military 
both from from France or well, France it has probably about about uh, five thousand you know chart at any point of time about two thousand plus the Mali military plus all of these European militaries at least 200 aircrafts, fixed wing and otherwise. Maybe 400, 600 military trucks and you just, you name it, I have been, been, been there. For the past nine years, nothing happened. It's when Mali decided, okay, we don't want it anymore. We're going to explore the Russian front. And that's all started about three months ago when we received first Russian equipment. What the French have not been able to, not the French, just everybody has not, what they've been able to do in 3,204 days, the Malian army under equipped and being equipped, you know, resolve it in less than 60 days. So what are rebellions for? What are insurgencies for? When you think about it, it's just this, these people, the same people, all of these people are at one point or another get logistical support from the French, French, French government and French army. So I'm going to stop here and uh, respond to here. Man. It's, just, it's just crazy. It's not just because I'm, I'm Malian, but it just doesn't make, it's very unfair. Thank you very much. Um, we're going to move into our Q and A session. Um, we've allotted about twenty minutes for it, but, and then Emily can open up for food. And if you still have questions for any of our speakers, um, we can do that sort of while people are eating. So, who wants to start with the questions? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I I just wanted a clarification of your last point because you are Russian. You must have you said the. The military junta that took over Mali resolved it in. Yeah. What did they resolve? Do you want to clarify? Okay. Um, one of the French. I'm sorry. Said, just a minute. Oh, yes. Can you make, make sure that the people get the question? Yeah, I can. Yeah. Did they get the question? You should be able to hear. Can you ever want to hear a question that was coming? You might have to think of this a little bit if you're out of the uh, you want to repeat your question? Oh, yes. So, so not for me. Yes. Well, my name is Benjamin, and thank you. I was just asking at your last point, you mentioned that despite the huge deployment of French and foreign military hardware, and that um, they couldn't resolve. And you were told that, and you were saying the military junta has resolved it. And I'm like, what did they resolve? Would you clarify? Okay. For example, the, uh, when the French face arrived, and it was only Northern Mali that was under insurgency. There were only 300 villages that had been abandoned. By the time, just about, uh, about only six months ago, about six months ago, there were several thousands. So imagine, they first arrived when there are only 300 people. And while they are there with all of their helpers, several thousand villages have been abandoned. And now, and actually, while under their watch, whole villages were raised. People were burned into their homes. People, car buses were stopped and gauze with gasoline and set on fire. People who have never fought each other you know, it's very, in my country, most people are linked by what's called a joking relationship. It's because you never fight each other. You know, you don't even don't come to face fight, let alone killing each other. These people have been killing each other. How can I explain that? No, all of these had stopped. Just it's just like by magic, things have changed. There have been about three hundred and fifty thousand people, you know, uh, internal uh, refugees. 
just the past eight weeks, 50,000 of these have been returned for. So these are some of the major changes that we have witnessed. Yes. Yeah. Okay, it's fine. Thank you. I wanted to ask in your view what you think of the regional block headquarters and how they have intervened or how they have tried to. In January, I happened to be home in Ghana when the ECOWAS summit happened. And our Ghanaian president is current ECOWAS chairman. He was, they issued a kind of statement saying the Malian junta military regime should basically give this timeline. I'm sure you follow. What do you think of the ECOWAS intervention in the region versus the military stance when it comes to handing power back to civilian rule? Honestly, it's not again because I'm Malian, I'm Pan African. You know, I'm the son of Pan I'm so disappointed in the land. You know, I could have expected this from anybody but a Ghanaian president. So equals, what it was the, just, I uh, you know, just uh, one, some of, one of the sanctions against Mali was a military embargo, uh, just embargo, embargo, economic financial embargo. They froze Malian money in West African uh, banks. That's for the government or for, even for semi-private institutions and close the borders. There is nothing in ECOWAS laws that allow anybody to close a border of any state to another state. So it was also an embargo on flights. You know, there is no flight between ECOWAS countries and Mali. For, it's, it's the French, but actually it, before the embargo, the French told Malians, you know, including the French uh, minister, Yves uh, Lidria, he told the whole world that they're going to call ECOWAS to put sanctions on money. So they don't even hide to do it anymore. And these stupid, you know, uh, how do you call them? Um, well, that much, uh, my, my own elders, you know, they are in their 80s. And, and in my language, you said that on the just bring all their grave and they just going to be lowered to the grave soon. And they follow this little guy, Macron, somebody who is their own <laughs> Greenish child. No, but that's how we see it. You know, because in Africa we have great respect for gray hair. You know this is something that is unacceptable. And recently you know Mali took the matters to uh, the uh, West African community, the financial community court. The community court said, we have to give them their money. And they still refuse. So they are breaking all kinds of laws. What it, we, we really want now in money is just we, we're going to leave ECOWAS, leave you know, this uh, currency, this monkey money. Because if you take CFR to France, they are not going to exchange it there. And think about it, how France is just printing this money and buying our stuff with it. The factories are in France where they're printing the money. No African works there. So they can print whatever they want. They want to buy your country, an African country, they will buy enough currency. They'll print enough currency to buy, go and buy it. But things are changing. You know, I have high hope, especially in your generation, because as you see, it's not just a matter of money anymore. It's a matter of the whole country. You know, I've never seen so much interaction between younger Africans of all parts of the world. Yes. Um. Thank you very much for the presentation. I actually have a follow-up question on the ECOWAS issue. Um, we were used to uh, seeing African, uh, I mean, Francophone African leaders being influenced by France. Mm -hmm. But we were really surprised to see ECOWAS with Nigeria and Ghana still being influenced by France. So, 
that is one of the questions that has, I always had in mind. How come France is able to influence Nigeria and Ghana? Well, with regards to um, Nigeria, you know, they want to um, open a business with Nigeria. That's how they are able to. But in Ghana, the same way too. You know, because I'm talking about building railway systems in Ghana, the Francis promise movies. You know, what actually makes me makes it even more disappointing is Nana Akufo Adu, who told uh, Emmanuel Macron, but we don't need your money anymore to build schools. You know, we don't need educational policies coming from. So we've been independent for about 60 years. We don't need anything from you. The same guy who said this, and that's when we all applauded him. And he turns around and he's just, you know, oh, it's just, it's, he, he would, they would do anything that Macron asked them to do. But NATO also is in it. That is why. We cannot forget about NATO. You know, because nobody knows how many Navy SEALs or how many, uh, uh, special forces of the United States are in this level. But watch, don't, they don't want to see China build, build its second uh, military, not, not actually maritime base, you know, in, in uh, the Gulf of Guinea. So NATO is something, you know, in uh, Ghana, in Ghana, in Nigeria. Do any of our other speakers want to answer that question? Oh. Okay. So could you repeat uh, the this about the influence of uh, France on Nigeria and yeah. Ghana? That mm -hmm. means of Anglophone countries. Yes. Yeah. yeah I, I, what uh, you should realize that uh, France doesn't operate alone in the Sahel. There are many European countries, Germany and the uh, uh, Northern European country, the British, they operate there. So it is quite possible that uh, the West can exercise, exercise collective influence on uh, Francophone, uh, Anglophone countries, not just of France and exercising uh, influence on Francophone countries, but pressure can be put on other countries in the region, including Af Anglophone countries, based on the collective interests of the West, which might include the US and other uh, Western countries. Um, <clears throat> there's a question in the chat actually um, from Joe that um, I think I, I would first respond to, which is about climate change. So I don't know, Joe, if you wanted to unmute and read the question or, or if I should read it for those who are um, at the African Institute. Oh, please go ahead. Okay. <clears throat> Climate change is clearly a major driver of the continued instability in the Sahel region, but where does its influence fit within the more immediate socio-political factors and local circumstances? To what extent does analyzing these revolutions within such an environmentally determined framework remove agency from the external forces of African people involved on both sides? Climate change may also be seen as an additive cause from Western industrialization, an existential limit to the recursive process inherent in capitalism. Um, so I think it's a really um, useful point about um, differentiating um, between 
what the proposed um, responses and solutions um, to some of these problems should be um, and the implications of those actions to be taken. Um, and so I, um, yeah, I, I would thank Joe for the question um, and to say that if we're talking about peace and we're talking about well-being um, and the implications of, of climate change for conflict, um, that the goal is not to pursue the kind of environmental determinism that we see you know, military strategists uh, instrumentalizing in order to justify ever more forms of intervention. Um, and, and that we can, you know, therefore both take seriously the real consequences of um, environmental destruction, extractivism, and climate change, um, but in a way that um, the solutions is not something that is going to just perpetuate that problem. And so when the U.S., you know, when U.S. Africa Command talks about, um, you know, desertification and intensification of local uh, conflict, um, they are doing so in a way that then further sows the seeds for forms of imperial intervention. Um, and that that is precisely the kind of removal of agency um, that that you're talking about. So there has to be a way in which you can simultaneously critique climate change and critique capitalism and critique militarism, um, if, if that makes sense. And then I also had just a question, um, if I could, for um, Kasim. This is such um, an important um, topic and discussion. And I was thinking about Mali in the context of um, of uh, the current conflict in Ukraine. Um, and if you see um, that there are any implications, direct or indirect, um, for Mali, given um, these forms of um, various imperial powers, um, Russia, France, the United States, um, it, it kind of, it, will there be fallout, do you think, um, for Mali, or um, do you see that there has already been uh, fa some fallout? Uh, there will probably be some fallout, so they may have already started. Um, but Mali has a very uh, odd relationship with, with Russia through the Soviet Union. To the point that you know, the, many of us in Mali, of my generation, to the point that we speak Russian. Is anybody here who speaks Russian? Okay, so the Mali and some, uh, and I don't know if you uh, uh, took notice, but many African countries either abstain, abstain from voting you know, against Russia. They did not vote at all at the UN. The only country that actually voted against Ukraine was Eritrea. So um, I think Africans more and more you know, are uh, disillusioned you know, with uh, the Western world. Because when you think of you know, many of the trouble that we have on, in Africa uh, came from the West, not from the Eastern Bloc. So I don't think it's going to matter that much to Mali at this point, because uh, for about 10 years, people have been slaughtered in such ways that uh, we think that you know, no matter what happens, will be better than uh, just going by uh, France or the United States. To add to this, also, uh, in, I don't know if you also noticed, the United States it has not completely abandoned France, but it is in Africa on, it, on, on its own right now. The US is dealing with Africans directly more and more. They're not just staying out of it, just out of Africa, uh, because African countries, because the countries once belonged to France. But doesn't happen anymore. In 19, I, don't, I can't remember exactly, but when once Bill Clinton was visiting Africa, 
and he landed in Dakar at an airport, and he had to call the president of France to tell him that he just arrived in Dakar. Why? Because he was, you know, on France's territory. So these kind of things, Americans don't do that anymore. I would like to address uh, the issue of uh, climate change a little bit. I have uh, a friend and colleague who was uh, once uh, in the first to the president of uh, Asia, and he witnessed a dialogue between the ambassador of China and the ambassador of France. But the ambassador of France was uh, criticizing the Chinese from taking, taking a, from French enterprises a contract that uh, he thought should normally go to France with the French businesses. And uh, the ambassador of China said that uh, Niger is the second producer of uh, uranium in the world, that uh, Niger gets more money from the farmers of onion than from the uranium exploited on the territory. So if we talk about uh, climate change, actually in, in, in Niger is a, that important in, in uh, uh, fueling 30% of uh, France energy, but uh, import all the oil from outside to power the country. But uh, the problem, for example, in the Sahel, is that uh, the so-called development project tend to create self-sustained enclaves of poverty. Take Areva, for example, the uranium company in Zender. They take so much territory, use so much water, and uh, those this water they Tuareg need, need it for their farming, and they take uh, the traditional farms from the Tuareg to, uh, to exploit uranium. So what do you expect the Tuareg to do? Okay. And then they are available to be recruited in terrorist, terrorist activities. So it, then it is possible that uh, foreign entities exploit the chaos created by climate change to take whatever resources, the mineral resources uh, from the territory, climate change doesn't prevent them to do that. But if climate change issue has to be addressed, then has to be focused. That should be a focus on the need of the local population rather than having big development schemes. Thank you. If I may, uh, Marcel. Yeah. Um, uh, with regards to Niger, it is known to the whole world that uh, the French uh, 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 extraction of uh, uranium in Niger has caused or is causing a lot of problems because they are pumping the water out of the aquifer in Niger to treat uranium. This water goes everywhere, you know, and Uranium, uranium extracts are found everywhere to the point that the level of radiation in many places around the Zender area is twice higher than radiation level in Chernobyl. And that is known to the whole humanity. Still with regard to Niger, uh, one of my professors when I was a student at Brandeis University, Ruth Morgenthau, from the same Morgenthau family of Bretton Woods, she was an undersecretary of state of the United Nations, of, 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 of the United States of the UN. And, but she had known Amari, Amari Jory before he became president of Niger. So she was approached by some businessmen in the United States who wanted her to take them, to lead them to Niger. And she took these Americans to Niger and uh, one thing, but uh, one place they wanted to visit were the places where there was this uranium mine. That's what led to Amani Jury's uh, the coup d'etat. 
That's one of the reason why he was overthrown. Less than two months after the visit of America's, you know, at the uranium mines, Amani Jory was overthrown. So Ruth Morgenthau wondered whether it was her visit with Americans and what may have caused uh, uh, Amani Jory his uh, uh, presidency. So it's true, but uh, we have environmental issues there, but there are not, nothing is being done by the West not to reverse it. I have two questions. I think this will be our last two questions before you open up for food and then yeah. we can continue the dialogue. With uh, uh, my first question is to Professor Murray. And um, thank you very much for coming back to your home in the Africa Initiative here. But my first question to you is, can you say something about how this coup d'etat in Burkina Faso will affect the trial of those who killed Thomas Sankara? Mm -hmm. And what do you perceive to be the political forces at work in Burkina Faso? That's my first question to Professor Mark. And my second question is to Professor Kasim. I would like you to say something more about the decision of the leaders of Mali about the future of the French language in Mali. Thanks very much, Professor Campbell. Um, so, yeah, I'm after um, a very long struggle for justice um, for Thomas Sankara. Um, it the decision um, finally to um, bring um, Blaise Compare to trial in absentia um, is already a preliminary um, victory. I say in absentia because um, he is um, currently, he has taken on um, Ivoirian citizenship um, and is, is being sheltered um, in Cote d'Ivoire. Uh, he um, had been um, after um, the, the popular uprising um, that um, took place after he had proposed to extend um, term limits to allow himself to run for presidency again. Um, he escaped with the protection of the French um, and, and ultimately has um, uh, now been um, living in, in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, so the trial for um, the murder of Thomas Sankara and um, 12 of his colleagues um, in 1987 has been ongoing for some time. Um, the trial was suspended following the coup d'etat um, and there was agreement actually on um, both sides, um, given that um, there was a state of constitutional exceptionalism and there was some fear that um, if a verdict was rendered, it could be subsequently argued to be illegitimate um, if, if it had um, happened in the wake of the coup d'etat. So I'll, things have been pro progressing very quickly since then. Um, and um, what I have heard subsequently is that there was a special judicial review of the issue um, and that the trial um, will now resume um, and that the verdict is to be issued um, actually early in April. So we will hear, um, it, within a matter of a couple of weeks, um, actually, what the verdict is. Um, there's been some dissatisfaction, I think, from activists on the ground. Um, the International Campaign for Justice for Sankara has been mobilizing for a long time to get France to declassify their secret archives. 
um, they had selectively done so. Um, and so um, the um, attorneys representing the families of the victims have had partial access to some declassified documents, but they haven't been made public. So it's really difficult to determine um, what, what those documents have said. And our sense is that a lot of them have been heavily redacted. Um, but certainly there has not been Emmanuel Macron had promised that he was going to declassify the documents that hasn't happened. Um, so there's still kind of a lack of, of French political will um, to acknowledge um, whatever uh, role they have had in either supporting the actors responsible for the assassination, um, the assassinations, um, or indirectly or or directly um so I, I think um you know i i shouldn't try to predict things i haven't um been privy to um the trial most of what i know is from um you know the international campaign for justice for sankara where i'm active and um you know lots of people reporting back on on the things that they see happening in wagadugu um so i think stay tuned and um and the good news is that there's um, there is a lot of activity from activists um, and a lot of pressure. Um, there are recently even um, more pressure on the French government, not just in the context of the assassinations um, in 1987 um, in uh, Burkina Faso, but in a number of different scandals involving the French state, um, where the French state has kind of protected itself under the guise of this um, this secrecy clause, um, which uh, allows the state to, uh, you know, render itself immune, essentially, um, by refusing to disclose its role um, in various scandals. And so just this last week, there is a big um, push from a different activist campaign against that policy in France. Um, and, and so the more um, that those groups, I think, are mobilizing, the more that perhaps um, you know, further information will, uh, will come out about precisely what happened. OK. With regard to the language issue in Mali, uh, this government is seriously considering, you know, um, giving more um, room to the national languages. And I think one of these uh, major reasons why, you know, the present government, you know, including the, this high uh, military persons you know, who have overthrown the power comes from the fact that they very rarely speak French to the people, always talk to the people in the local languages. And that's what uh, the government plans to do, to just to have uh, uh, a few languages uh, as national or official languages of a country. And fr French would become a language like any other language. Um, but when you think about Francophonie and this just whole idea of trying to make everybody speak uh, from French is this not going to work. Well, it's maybe working, uh, but people are finding out that French language does not have that much anymore as it wants to, as a diplomatic language. By the year 2015, 85% of Francophone people, people who speak French will be on the African continent. Because French is losing ground in France itself. I don't know if you know. In many universities in France today, you know, that giving courses, courses are being taught in English. If you get a degree, you know, unless you have functional knowledge in English, you're not going to have a job in France. So the language will survive through the Africans. I'll be happy to see because that is one thing that I've always done, you know, 
I very rarely have, have written something and published it in English without having previously done it in my native language. So I, I, am, I wrote a monolingual dictionary of my native language. I was the first person to do it. You know, and many Malians are doing the same thing, they're working with local language. That has been going on for some time now. But uh, uh, I think that's why it's going to hurt the French the most, because you know, they lose that the former colonies losing the language is probably going to hurt the most. I want to say a big thank you to all of our speakers. Like I said, we can continue this Q&A as people start to head out and get food. Um, so if we could all say thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I know that for, for, um, for Amber, what time is it there now in Oxford? Oh, it's 11. 11 o'clock. Oh, thank you so much for staying up to being with us. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Anytime. Thank you. Yeah. Au revoir. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You didn't speak in Bambra. You spoke of what? Why didn't you no, speak? he doesn't speak. Oh, okay. Marcel, 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 so tell me the most important language <laughs> Computer in Computer design some of the yeah, francophone. Okay. There's food in the hallway. What, what's the most important language in Mali? Bambara. Bambara. Huh? Songhai. Songhai. But spoken Timbuktu and Gao. Uh -huh. uh, these are the leading languages, actually. Two languages. Bambara, Songhai. Because 80% of Malians speak Bambara. OK. So uh, what? Vous parlez français? Oui. Vous parlez Bambara. If you have it, please sign in on our sheets. We can add you to our mailing list and be notified about future events. Oh, yeah. And it's very simple. And the ones that are exactly the same like, mm -hmm. okay yeah. bye bye everybody the ones are the same right. especially if you have but uh, i teach about uh, swahili in my linguistic class oh, the one tell him yeah. uh, it's, it's about the only tell, like, yeah. time you, you speak i to come to you know deal with swahili so you